Hello, everyone. I'm truly honored today to be speaking with Daniel Ellsberg. He was a Marine who went on to become a military analyst during the Vietnam War. But when he learned our government had been lying to us about the war in Vietnam, he ultimately decided to share the truth with the public by leaking the famous Pentagon paper study to the press. They mean balls Ellsberg. We gotta get this son of a bitch. Dan was the first person in history to be prosecuted for sharing true information with the American people. He faced life in prison, and he's here with us to talk about his experience and what's going on today in the current case against Julian Assange. Assange is the former editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks, who now faces life in prison for exposing the truth about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's the first time in history the government has prosecuted a publisher for publishing. So, Daniel Ellsberg, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure, Matt. Glad to be here. Interestingly enough, I found a video of you on C-SPAN in March 2010, urging whoever had the Afghanistan papers to leak them immediately. I think the Pentagon Papers of Afghanistan, when they come out, and I hope it will be soon, they would read almost exactly like the Pentagon Papers of Vietnam. We cannot afford a trillion dollars on this deadly, devastating, hopeless venture. And if finally, what I've been saying for years to people in the government, don't okay. do what I did. Don't wait till the bombs have fallen. Okay. Don't wait till the escalation. Go now with what you know about these lies and tell the truth. A few months later, WikiLeaks published nearly 100,000 documents on the war in Afghanistan. WikiLeaks.org, a whistleblower website, has published 92,000 official U.S. documents of raw data on the deaths and casualties collected over the past six years. The founder of the website calls it, quote, the total history of the Afghan war from 2001 until now, 2010. The total squalor of the war. Now, Julian Assange himself, he says his motivation for putting out this information is that he simply wants more transparency. He wants abuses that are being conducted in this war uh, to be corrected. So what WikiLeaks says is that it's making it open to the public so that everybody, not just journalists, but soldiers, witnesses, anybody involved in these events can look up the information, verify them and tell the world what's really happening in Afghanistan. Civilian casualties have been even higher than admitted. And it paints a very grim picture more grim than the official portrayal. The U.S. government is currently prosecuting Assange for publishing these leaks and others. He faces a total of 175 years in prison. So when did you first learn about WikiLeaks? I first learned when I got an email from somebody named Julian Assange out of the blue saying that he was starting a group. I'm not sure he called it WikiLeaks then, but he wanted me to be on the board of directors because of my past. And uh, I was one of the first, perhaps the first that he'd asked. But the idea was to print classified information that was leaked that ought to be out. And for that just to come over email like that, that looked to me like either it was a clear trap set by NSA or CIA to draw in possible leakers or that he was somebody very naive to imagine that he could escape the surveillance of CIA, NSA. And, you know, it just didn't seem to make sense. So I actually did email him back asking for more information about it and raising these po these the latter point, at least. And I never heard back on that. And uh, time passed. I think I heard very tangentially about some of the work they did on China and on Kenya and uh, other exposés. But I didn't pay close attention to it. And the first thing that really brought it to my attention then was the collateral murder video. Classified video that showed a 2007 helicopter attack that killed a dozen people in Iraq, including two Reuters employees, a journalist and his driver. As a former Marine company commander, no question in my mind as I looked at that, that the specific late pictures in there of helicopter gunners hunting down and shooting an unarmed man in civilian clothes, clearly wounded in an area where a squad of American soldiers was about to appear, as the helicopter gunners knew, to take custody of anyone remaining living. That shooting was murder. It was a war crime. 
And when I saw that, I thought, oh, they didn't want that out. And uh, he did manage to get past them somehow. So that showed me right away, my goodness, <laughs> there's something here that, that can really work. And then, of course, the uh, Afghan war logs came out. They were shared with The Guardian, The New York Times and Der Spiegel by the whistleblower's website, WikiLeaks. It will show the, the true nature of this war. And then the, the public from Afghanistan and other nations um, can see what's really going on and take steps to address the problems. I was impressed. And um, then I got a call from Julian Assange saying, I'm going to put out the Iraq war logs and said he would like me to be with him and help introduce these Iraq war logs to the press in uh, London. By the way, I had had some misgivings, uh, definitely, about his releasing all that he had more or less simultaneously with the newspapers. I felt that it would be uh, better tactically in various ways to let them decide what to put out, what was newsworthy, at least in the, you know, in the first instance. Because they had large staffs that could go over it and select from this material. Uh, obviously, no one person could read all of that. I took it for granted that it had not been possible for him to read all that. And uh, I thought that he would be open to charge that he had put out something that he shouldn't have, you know, if he made it all available. And I passed that on to him. And he said, uh, yeah, he took that into account. And he was doing that with the Iraq war logs, which he did do. And um, uh, so he called me and said, could I go? Well, I was in New York at that point. I live in San Francisco. I didn't have a passport with me. I called my wife and she FedExed the passport to me, which I got the next day. And I got on a plane and went to London. And there was a kind of funny aspect to that. Actually, somebody fundraising for a school auctioned off a dinner with Daniel Ellsberg, it so happened, for the school. They got a good deal of money for it. And uh, I said, I, I just couldn't do that. I had to go to London. And I had postponed it once already. So the guy who was in charge of that, who was a big rock and roll producer, and he said, you can't do that. This has been all arranged. You don't understand, Dan. He said, I've had the Rolling Stones. I've had the Beatles. I've had everybody. Nobody has ever canceled on me before. And I said, well, I'm not an entertainer, uh, you know, so-and-so. This is very important to me. And he said, you don't understand, Dan. These are very important people. <laughs> and, and I said, don't they know what I do? This is my, my life here, you know, is, is uh, helping reveal truths like this to the public. Mm -hmm. And here, Julian Assange is over there. The entire world full of governments are down on him. He's got the whole weight of practically every state in the world who hates what he's doing. And uh, he's there alone. I've got to be with him. That's all. So I said, I will personally have a dinner with each of these people when I come back. Everything will I'll go absolutely forthcoming. He said, they don't want to meet you anymore. This was after this. Gone. <laughs> and I, I never repaired relations with this guy. I never saw one of the people, these very important people, wonder who they were. <laughs> wow. So, um, uh, so I went there and um, met Julian that night talked to him at length. And then we went before the Frontline Club, a lot of press. And I talked about the need for whistleblowing and, and my support of what he was doing, you know, and so forth. And he released these papers. And then I saw him uh, more, you know, for another couple of days before I came back. So I liked him. You know, I like him. He's a friend. I think of him as a friend. I identify with Chelsea Manning and with Ed Snowden. I identify more with them than any other people in the world. We've been through the same trajectory of change in our attitudes of what our obligations were as citizens and as humans and come out the same way in what turns out to be a very unusual way. I don't identify in the same way with Julian because he um, was a publisher. He was like the New York Times or Le Monde or something. Uh, not a source like me or the others. And yet it was clear that he was, I had no doubt that he was a very courageous person willing to take risks. Anyway, a long answer to my relation with Julian. Here's another question I want to ask you. You have called Julian Assange the most dangerous man in the world. So explain what you mean by that. 
Well, of course, the context of that is that uh, Henry Kissinger had called me the most dangerous man in America. We felt so strongly that we were dealing with a national security crisis. Henry Kissinger said that Dr. Daniel Ellsberg was the most dangerous man in America and he had to be stopped. Why did he say I was the most dangerous man in America and I must be stopped at any cost? It was because they knew that I had information that I had not yet revealed, information about the Nixon administration itself, and specifically about plans they had that they did not want revealed because they would be so controversial. And that was for plans for escalation, threats they were making against North Vietnam, of escalation in Vietnam, not getting out, but increasing the war, including nuclear weapons. And to stop me then, uh, they did take uh, criminal measures, including giving orders to incapacitate me totally on May 3rd, 1972. Okay, so um, then when these materials came out, in particular uh, Ed Snowden's, about the vast illegal surveillance that the NSA was doing in this country where it was illegal and in contradiction to uh, the possibilities of democracy and openness anywhere in the world, the NSA was listening to everybody essentially and taking down everything, recording everything. So uh, I did say then publicly, if I'm the most dangerous man in America, then Ed Snowden say, or Julian Assange are the most dangerous men in the world. Can you go on to explain what you mean by that and how that's different from the meaning of Henry Kissinger. Oh, it's uh, it's not so different because uh, when I call them dangerous, I mean dangerous to state policies that cannot bear public exposure. And every state has such policies. All politicians lie in all governments. And uh, they don't all have imperial policies, uh, certainly, which uh, involve regime change in other countries, covert operations, uh, assassinations, torture. Em all empires do, and we are such an empire. But uh, all states have something to hide from their own people. For example, a kind of collaboration between other countries and the U.S. in our imperial operations that they don't want known by their own people that would shame them in effect. So he's a danger to them in terms of what he could reveal about what they're doing to surveil their own citizens. Obviously, to some degree, I was that danger already. But, you know, in the uh, pre-digital world, it took me a long time to copy 7,000 pages, and I couldn't have done that uh, without the new cutting-edge technology of the copying machine of Xerox. But now Chelsea Manning or Ed Snowden were able digitally to put out a thousand times more information than I did, perhaps a million times. Uh, in other words, it's gotten a lot easier to put out those government secrets, but on the other hand, uh, not uh, easier to escape detection necessarily. A number of people have been prosecuted now in this country three times more than were prosecuted before Obama, were prosecuted under President Obama. And then Trump has done even more in three years than Obama did, plus enlarged this now to go after a journalist directly for the first time. I recall you saying that Trump is a dangerous president. So can you explain who's a bigger danger to society? Those who are dangerous in the way that Assange and WikiLeaks are dangerous or the danger that Trump and other presidents pose? So let's clarify this. Uh, Henry Kissinger at the time, he said that I think was national security assistant. He later became secretary of state. Uh, what's dangerous to a politician is not what's dangerous to the public. We're talking about what's dangerous to his reputation, his access, or for lower officials, their clearance, their careers, their jobs. And what's dangerous is for the truth to come out, to be revealed to the public about what they and their colleagues are doing or have done or plan to do and what the costs are projected and the risks that they're taking. In a democracy, this is information, most of which needs to be known to the public. 
There are, of course, pieces of information, especially in a wartime situation, uh, where secrets have to be kept from an adversary, from an enemy. And in the course of that, from the public as well, so as to keep them secret. In other words, I don't believe there should be no secrets, but there should be about one half of 1% of the number of secrets that are held. I don't pull that off the wall because a, a real expert on this subject, William Florence, who testified before Congress and then testified under oath at my trial, had written most of the regulations in the Pentagon on classification matters. There was no one more expert than he. And he testified both in Congress and in my trial that about 5% of the information held classified justified, qualified for its level of classification, top secret or secret or secret, in terms of possible danger to the nation, to the national security, 5%, one twentieth. He said, but that was true at the time it was classified. He said, within a couple of years, this need to protect from the point of view of the nation decays very rapidly. He said, within a couple of years, it's probably a tenth of that half of 1%. Most of what's classified, well, you know, the vast amount is more than several years old. My 7,000 pages of top secret documents, which were not randomly collected, these were hot, high level, important documents. That's why they were in this study, in this collection. 7,000 pages, they were all three years old or more when they came out in 71, because the study ended in 68. But they went back to 1945. A lot of them were still top secret, though they'd been from 45 or 46. Not a line was ever found convincingly to have harmed the United States or be capable of harming the United States. They weren't able to find anything they could say uh, that had harmed. Just as in Chelsea Manning's case or the Assange case right now, they weren't able to identify a single individual who had actually been harmed by this release, even though they claimed there was blood on their hands for releasing this. Mr. Assange can say whatever he likes about the greater good he thinks he and his source are doing. But the truth is they might already have on their hands the blood of some young soldier or that of an Afghan family. The people at WikiLeaks could have uh... Uh, blood on their hands. He does clearly have uh, blood on his hands. The blood is on their hands. Ten years have passed. They haven't found one person who was harmed. It surprised me almost, given how hard they were looking for it. In fact, I would have expected them to manufacture that, just as I still can't entirely explain why they didn't manufacture evidence of anthrax in Iraq and bring it back. Remember, Colin Powell held up a little vial and said, look, in here is enough to properly distributed to kill a city or a country or something like that. You know, if anthrax, when they couldn't find any WMDs, any biological, chemical or, or nuclear weapons in Iraq, I would have expected them to bring back at least a vial of something they claimed they'd found. How hard could that be? I don't entirely know why that didn't happen. Certainly not because they were too conscientious and too truthful to do that. Absolutely not. They'd been lying. Well, Colin Powell was lying at that point about the uh, basis for the claims he was making. That particular one, by the way, was based on one source, codenamed Curveball, who was controlled by the Germans, who said, we cannot verify this source. He's not a reliable source. And here, Colin was saying, and Rumsfeld was saying, this is not suspicion. This is proof. We have unequivocal evidence of this. Uh, as Rumsfeld said about the weapons of mass destruction, we know where they are. And I'll tell you, when they said that publicly, even I, long after the Pentagon Papers, so I'm not the most naive, credulous person here, but I didn't think they'd say that without having something. They had nothing. There was evidence for it, but the evidence was as equivocal and uncertain as the evidence that there had been an attack on our two destroyers in the Tonkin Gulf on August 4th, 1964, the day I came into the Pentagon. Uh, there was evidence for that. 
but it was very controverted. It was very thin. It was very uncertain. And I heard my president say, and my secretary of defense, my boss, McNamara, say, we have unequivocal evidence of an unprovoked attack in open international waters, et cetera, et cetera. And we seek no wider war. And every one of those was a flat lie. And I knew it that night. Not that they had no reason to believe that there had been an attack, but to say that it was a basis for starting a war, you know, or sending, in that case, 90 sorties or so uh, over North Vietnam, absurd. That was a, a lie that could not have stood any public examination, but didn't get it for many years. Mm -hmm. The NSA didn't admit the falsity of some of the most clear-cut evidence, supposedly, for about 40 years. Uh, in other words, people who make lies like that at the top of the government, like Bush, Cheney, uh, Rumsfeld, Powell, or years earlier, McNamara, do so in confidence they won't be found out because they're confident that no one will tell on them. People who know better, uh, who know the truth, and at least know how equivocal this evidence is, which, remember, in both cases turned out to be false. Mm -hmm. You know, we did learn. There, no, there was no attack, and there were no WMDs. Yep. And uh, what I'm saying is the, the clear-cut lie was right at the beginning, saying that we know this and we know it when, in fact, at best, it was very tendentious. And then, of course, as time went on, they did know it had been a lie, and, of course, no one corrected it. So people with the moral courage, like Snowden or Chelsea, to tell the truth at the risk of their freedom, the risk even of their lives, are very dangerous, but they're dangerous to the state. They are dangerous to the wars that are being carried on wrongly. And of course, it is those wars that are dangerous, uh, not only to the people who are directly killed and all the civilians are killed, but to the societies that are either destroyed or, or in our own case, uh, demoralized in many ways and divided by these wars. Colin Powell could have stopped the movement of what has come to be 37 million refugees. 37 million refugees came out of our Iraq war and the war, you know, the rest of our interventions in Syria and uh, Afghanistan and elsewhere, aside from millions of dead, which we count as hundreds of thousands or so forth. No, it's actually uh, 10 times more than that. Yo, So it doesn't occur to them to do something that would be actually opposition to their leader, their boss, the man who hired them, the man who gave them his trust, which would stamp you as someone not to be trusted in the future for in powerful positions, not to be hired, even in corporations. Uh, Tom Drake, who revealed information about the unconstitutional surveillance to the inspector general. Basically, what Snowden revealed later, he revealed it to the inspector general. He revealed it to people in Congress. He didn't actually reveal it to the New York Times. Someone else did that. But since he had spoken honestly, even internal challenge, he was believed to be a source to the New York Times, wrongly. Result, uh, bankrupted in defending himself. And now, even though... In the end, the government charges fell down. He remains at the genius bar of an Apple store in Virginia, I believe it is. Mary, Maryland. Maryland, Bethesda, yeah. I spoke with him for a couple hours, and yeah, it's an incredible story. And it's incredible that more people don't know that story. He's one of the top computer experts in the world, in the country, in the world. He was at the top levels of NSA. And... Um, I have personally spoken to heads of large corporations and said, how can you not be using the talents of this man? And uh, it turns out, uh, I can only infer, A, they don't want to be in trouble with the government with whom they have enormous contracts. Yes. And this guy is, uh, you know, anathema uh, because he told their secret or was honest about it. 
And B, I suspect, as in my own case, as with every whistleblower, they can't trust him not to do it to them, to tell the truth yeah. where they're being very wrong mm -hmm. and deceitful. I remember a friend of mine, James Thompson, who was later head of the Neiman Fellows, journalist at Harvard, was speaking to a class while I was on trial in 1972, I think it was, the incoming class of freshmen at Harvard at their you know, orientation kinds of things. And he said, how many of you here admire Daniel Ellsberg or believe he did the right thing? He told me, nearly everyone raised their hands. And how many of you would hire him? Nobody. Uh, I was told at my last class reunion that I went to that now, after maybe 50 years, possibly less than half of the class regarded me still as a traitor. Uh, I haven't gone back since. <laughs> mm. I don't need this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have you, there for sure, but I don't have to go to a reunion to see yeah. that. Julian Assange uh, said that there is a superpower of the accused and they, the superpower of the accused is that when you're accused of such terrible things as being a traitor and on and on, when it's not really the case, the superpower is you are able to see who really is your friend and who is not. Oh, I, I don't think I would use the word. No. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a it's a it's a superpower, but it's got some serious drawbacks to it <laughs> as well. Let's not. I'm not trying to dismiss that. <laughs> I effectively, with less than a handful of exceptions, I lost every male friend I had in June of 1971 because they all had clearances. They all had clearances at risk. And it's not just the question of were they friends or not. It really was a danger, a risk for them, of serious to their careers if they showed any tolerance for a person who had violated those secrecy regulations in the interest of the country, which, as I say, it's now rather widely acknowledged uh, that I did do. They, it, 50 years have passed and no harm has been identified from what I did. And the Vietnam War is not regarded as uh, such a noble cause generally. But uh, so in a way, uh, I'm now the good whistleblower after 50 years. And I got a lot of attention for that in the last 10 years, thanks to Julian and uh, Chelsea Manning, and then three years later, Snowden, because I'm the good whistleblower. People don't want to say there's never a good, never right to tell the truth. I'm not against, uh, you know, any disclosures. Um, Van Ellsberg did it right, you know, and he was a good guy. So I was used as a foil as I testified in court against the bad whistleblower here, you know, and they tried to make all kinds of, um, of uh, distinctions here. And a, uh, an article actually that enraged me in the New Yorker, actually made made that point, you know, that Snowden bad, Ellsberg good. They didn't print my rebuttal of that. Mm, oh my God. <laughs> There's a huge problem we're going to get into more, how the, the media really isn't covering this Assange case. Uh, well, certainly not fairly. That's nothing new, but not even covering it at all in many cases. Um, here, so they didn't give you an opportunity to give a rebuttal. Let me get your rebuttal on former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, who said... Unlike the Pentagon Papers, one of the things that is important, I think, in all of these releases, whether it's Afghanistan, Iraq, or uh, the releases this week, is, is the lack of any significant difference between what the U.S. government says publicly and what these things show privately. Whereas in the Pentagon Papers showed that many in the government were not only lying to the American people, they were lying to themselves. So basically he's saying the Pentagon Papers exposed government lies and that the WikiLeaks releases did not. What do you have to say about that? I'm astonished, frankly. I don't think well of Secretary of Defense Gates in a lot of ways. But I honestly did not think he would say something so false and lying as that. The Afghanistan war logs, of course, show a war in which there is no progress. Although progress is claimed every other day by the Pentagon, as in Vietnam. That is an exact simile to the Pentagon Papers. 
and to Vietnam. I call Afghanistan Vietnamistan. About a year ago, we got finally declassified all these reports about Afghanistan showing that everybody there knew that they were thoroughly stalemated, as in Vietnam. The Afghan war logs showed that in 2010. So for Gates to say that about documents relating to a war that they were constantly saying were making progress, just give us more troops, just do this or that. There you are. That was one of the central lies of the Vietnam War. It was a central lie of the Afghan War, which has now gone on for 19 years. Documents sent to WikiLeaks by Chelsea Manning also revealed another giant lie. I want to be absolutely clear with our people and the world, the United States does not torture. I can say without exception or equivocation that the United States will not torture. Okay, Chelsea Manning reveals not just one case, but hundreds of cases where our troops have turned over Iraqi prisoners to Iraqi troops, knowing they would be tortured. And they were tortured, but predicting it and raising this question to their superior officers. And in every case, in documentation that Chelsea provided, the superior said, don't investigate this further, don't pursue it, drop it. Chelsea herself was in that position in the intelligence system of uh, raising this question with a superior intelligence officer and being told, don't worry about it. Now, the international law of this and the general law, domestic law is that failure to investigate a credible allegation of torture, failing to prosecute it if there's grounds for prosecution, is as criminal as the torture itself. And the fact that Chelsea found hundreds of cases of this shows that it was a policy. It wasn't a few bad apples here who were doing this. It was a policy that had to really basically go up to the White House. Obama must have okayed that torture or somebody that he trusted with that authority to do that. And that meant that Chelsea, unlike me, was bringing criminal charges or evidence against the current president, Obama himself, as well as earlier. Now, for Gates to say that she didn't reveal, what, any deception, any criminality, that's awful. It's I, insane. That of Gates. And I'll tell you why. Because Gates told the truth later. He said there hasn't been any substantial harm. Gates said embarrassment, but not real harm. Now, I've heard the impact of these releases on our foreign policy described as as a meltdown, as uh, as a game changer and so on. I think I think those descriptions are uh, fairly significantly overwrought. Is this is this embarrassing? Yes. Is it awkward? Yes. Consequences for U.S. foreign policy, I think, fairly modest. Ten years after Julian Assange published the historic material on America's foreign wars, the government still can't point to a single individual harmed as a result of the publications. But the government has charged Assange with up to 175 years in prison for publishing information. The ACLU calls this an unprecedented attack on the freedom of the press. Assange currently sits in a maximum security prison in Britain awaiting extradition to the U.S. At 89 years old, Daniel Ellsberg testified in court defending Assange, and he continues to work tirelessly to save his friend and the First Amendment. The American First Amendment, the core of our form of government, is at stake. If Julian is extradited, it will lead to prosecution here and probably conviction, and he will be the first journalist and publisher, but not the last. New York Times probably won't be the second either. It might be the third or the fourth. So uh, everybody has a stake in this. If Julian is extradited to the United States to face these charges for doing the journalism that he has, no journalist in the world is safe from life imprisonment in the United States of America. So the stakes here are enormous. And for freedom of the press anywhere, ours is far from perfect. Other places have less, a few have more. But the possibility of freedom of the press and thus of democracy is at stake 
all over the world in this. That sounds almost certainly like hyperbole, and it isn't. Thanks so much to Daniel Ellsberg for speaking with me, and thank you for listening. Please subscribe for part two, where we discuss the CIA's plots to poison both Daniel Ellsberg and Julian Assange. Man, great job, Matt. He goes by the name Orf. Someone that I respect and whose work I admire. So call him Matt Because I don't want to butcher his name. Matt Orphalia. Matt Orphalia. Matt Orphalia. Subscribe to him. Matt Orf. Matt Orphala. Matt Orphala. Matt Orphala. Good work, Matt. I've seen your other clips here. Very good. Very good stuff.